All right, uh, we're back again this week with Pastor Trent, uh, and um, this week we have uh, quite a challenge, Pastor. Uh, we're going to try to get through four uh, four of uh, Paul's letters, and um, you know, I guess before I didn't even say, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, four letters, and they're shorter letters, but they're just as packed with, with good stuff, so... <laughs> Packed, I would say yes. Uh, you know, you could spend a lot of time uh, studying these uh, these passages, but we're going to try to uh, tackle this today. So, uh, I'm going to open in prayer, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you again for bringing us together uh, through this medium, and we just pray that you would again help us to focus the next few minutes. Father, uh, we know that you have. Uh, promise to give us a blessing, uh, an opening and reading and studying in your word. And we just ask for that. And we ask that we would draw closer to you uh, uh, and our listeners would be blessed through uh, this, through this podcast today. So we ask and we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, pastor. Um, these are three of the four letters here are called, uh, uh, prison epistles, uh, and, and I think the fourth uh, prison epistle is uh, Philemon. If I'm not, if I'm not wrong there, right? That's right. That's correct. So, but uh, Galatians kind of the odd one out, maybe a little bit. But uh, um, talk about the prison epistles uh, since uh, we're talking three out of the four letters here. Why, why they were written, where they were written, to whom they were written. And uh, did they deal with similar topics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And in the book of Acts, we've talked about Paul being a missionary, an apostle. And uh, he, he, he went to uh, launch these three great missionary journeys between Acts 13 and 21. And so some of his books are written during that period of his ministry. But then Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. He was held in Caesarea for about two years. And then they wanted to take him back to Jerusalem to be tried and he knew it wasn't going to be a fair a fair hearing there so he appealed to Caesar so he was taken to Rome to stand trial before the emperor and these books were written during that period of time uh, while he was in prison in Rome and so you might think that you know being in prison wrongfully accused you'd be kind of bitter and upset and depressed and that was not the case Paul understood that even though he was in chains the gospel was not in chains and he used that time for good. I mean, he was working. He was in prison. He was working. He was writing letters, encouraging churches. And so, yes, you're right. You talk about the similar themes. He's um, updating the churches on his situation. He's asking for prayer. Um, some of these letters deal with he's joyful despite his circumstances. We see a man who's not angry at the world or upset that life isn't fair, uh, but a man who's trusting in God, rejoicing in all of his circumstances, and so I guess that tells us we might not always like the circumstances we find ourselves in, but God is still good. God is still faithful. God is working in those circumstances in some way so we can rejoice no matter what we're going through. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a, that certainly is a message we got to take away here. You know, your theology will affect your perspective um, in life and um, you know, it will, it will dictate how you respond to situations. So I think that's an important point uh, that we can glean, our listeners can glean, and no matter what our circumstances are, uh, God is in control. And um, yeah, I mean, I think we have uh, some good theology here, uh, some really strong foundations, and maybe we can talk about those as we kind of go along through um, in, in these um, in these books. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about Galatians. Maybe you can talk a little in general generalities about Galatians, because that was kind of left out of our last uh, discussion, and or uh, let's revisit, though, Pastor, this uh, this concept of justification. I think it's such an important concept uh, for our listeners, uh, any any serious uh, Bible stu uh, student to understand. So I know we've talked about justification, but let's revisit that as well as it's presented here in Galatians. Yeah, good. Uh, Galatians is possibly many believe Paul's earliest letter. It's, it's possible it was one of his first letters that he wrote. 
Um, he was writing to uh, churches in uh, Galatia. And uh, the, yeah, justification by faith is a key theme. We talked about that in Romans. There's a lot of connection. We talked about how uh, Romans impacted Martin Luther's theology. Galatians was another book that impacted Luther's theology. Um, justification is a legal term. It means to be de to be declared righteous in the eyes of God. And so in the legal sense, you can picture the judge pounding the gavel, saying not guilty. And justification is God saying, you know, not guilty. Um, and it's not because of what we have done. It's not that we have made ourselves innocent before God. It's, you know, we're guilty, but Christ took our sin on himself and right. clothes us in his righteousness. So justification is something that happens at a moment when you believe you are justified by faith in, in Christ. And um, so God wipes away our sin, wipes away our guilt. And uh, some have described it just as if I never sinned or just as Jesus is just. Those are kind of mnemonic devices that help us remember that. This is really important in this letter because in, in the background of Galatians, Paul is writing, Paul's frustrated. You can see his frustration as, he's write, as he writes this book because some false teachers have, have moved in and they're teaching that faith in Christ is good, but if you really want to be saved, if you really want to be right with God, if you really want to be a Christian, you need faith plus the works of the law. Faith yeah. plus circumcision was the big one, the big marker that the Jewish people, you know, the Jewish men, that, that's what how you entered into Judaism. Um, you know, the holy days, the dietary restrictions. Faith is great, but faith plus works is what you really need to, to be right with God. And Paul is saying, hey, if you are trusting in your works to be made right with God, then you've missed you've missed the point of the gospel. You've missed the gospel. Um, you know, Paul has some strong words for those teachers. He says, if anybody preaches a gospel other than the one I preach to you, let him be accursed because it's a false gospel. And I, I think that persists in some circles today, this idea that, okay, faith is good, but faith plus works is what you need. Faith plus the sacraments, faith plus religious deeds, faith, you know, faith plus this. Um, you know, again, I think we talked about, and when we talked about Romans, how uh, our pride, we, we want to do something to contribute to our salvation. But the gospel says we can only come with empty hands and receive receive salvation by faith. And then it's a life that's been transformed that results in, in good works to God. Yeah. So, Pastor, what's the danger of, uh, of faith? But what, what's, what's the harm in faith plus? I mean, uh, I'm just covering all my bases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to see if, if you're trusting and, OK, you know, like you're saying, yeah, Jesus did this, but then I have to do this. You're not, you know, the, the reform or the yeah, the Protestant Reformation had the, this uh, this motto, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. It's it's only what Christ has done. I can do nothing. You know, yeah. I can I can bring nothing. Um, scripture says all of my works are filthy rags before God. And so it's only after I've been washed that my works can bring honor to him. So if I'm trusting in faith plus what I've done, I'm not really trusting in what Christ has done completely. Right. And I think that you hit it right there for me. Um, you know, um, yeah. Can you be saved by um, by having faith and then doing works? Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm not sure that you're going to be rewarded for those works if you're if you're doing it out of your own self preservation and interest. But um, and I and I don't. I'm not God. I'm, I'm not pretending to to know that. But. Um, I think the danger is, is that people, if, if we're practicing that, putting that into practice, is that other people see us and they think that, well, gee, that guy has to do all of these things in order to, uh, in order to be right with God. And so I guess if I do all of these things, I can be right with God, not thinking about uh, the freedom that we have in Christ to just say, yeah, um, you know, Christ, he has set us free. And if you, if, if you believe in Jesus, you will be free indeed. I think Jesus actually said those words uh, to the Pharisees, and uh, and it's hard to accept that. It is sometimes in our humanity. It, it's very hard to mm -hmm. accept that it's that simple. Um, but uh, anyway, I had a lot of other questions and thoughts, but we've got a lot to cover, and we got to move along. So. Um, 
Okay, so let's move along uh, uh, to this concept of the mystery. Uh, we see it. Uh, we see this concept of the mystery of uh, of the church used eight times in Ephesians and uh, four more times in Colossians. Um, a very important term to, to dispensational theology. Um, and, uh, you know, so we'll kind of talk about that and how, how that fits into our belief in dispensationalism. And then, you know, how is that different kind of compare and contrast um, covenant theology and, uh, and dispensational theology, Pastor? I know it's a, it's a that's a huge task right there. Book. There's a couple of books that are, you know, <laughs> about this topic, but kind yeah. of, uh, if you can, uh, in a few minutes, uh, some yeah. of the force. Yeah, good. And you, you know, you talked about Ephesians, uh, or maybe we were talking beforehand, Ephesians really laying some doctrine, doctrine is specifically about the church. Like Paul is teaching, what what is the church? Who Who are we as the body of Christ? Um, Ephesians is really about the church and Christ is the head of the church. And you're right. He mentions this word mystery and this a mystery. We, we love, we talk about mystery novels, you know, the whodunit, but a mystery in scripture is something that was kept secret, something that was hidden, never before revealed. It was always in the mind of God, but something that he hadn't made known to man. So God, God doesn't make things up as he goes. God's plan is eternal, but he doesn't make things known all at once. He reveals it. A little at a time. And so um, specifically in Ephesians and Colossians, Paul's talking about the mystery of the church, God's plans and purposes for this church age, this dispensation of grace. You know, God God um, has always talked about uh, reaching the Gentile world, but it's in, in the Old Testament, in the prophets, we read about God working through Israel to reach the Gentile world. Well, today in this dispensation of grace, you know, Israel is the, as a nation has hardened its heart against God and has been temporarily set aside and god is working through the church the body of christ which is believing jews believing gentiles brought together on 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 the same footing um the the gospel is going forth to to people of every nation tongue and tribe and that was a mystery god hadn't revealed that in the old testament and um, paul says you know god has made it known today uh, god has made it known to us in this body of christ um, ephesians 3 Five says in other generations, this was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. Be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Um, and so I guess you you had talked about what is a dispensation that's kind of tied in with this. Yeah. Um, is that you want me to talk, sit, spend a couple minutes talking about that or a couple yeah. seconds? Yeah. About that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. In a nutshell, what is, what is dispensationalism or what is a dispensation? Um, you know, imagine, I like to explain it this way. A dispensation is a, is a, 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 an era of redemptive history. So maybe we, we have our favorite novels. Maybe you have a novel that you've read that you enjoy. The novel advances a story over a series of chapters. So like I, The Hobbit is a great, a great novel. I love that. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, read it. it it's not one big, you know, there's chapters in that book to, that gets you, that advances the plot. And in each chapter, there might be different characters that are introduced. Uh, each chapter advances the story in some way. And so the dispensations um, are advancing God's plan of redemption. God is advancing his, history is his story. His, his story of redemption is being un unfolded over history. And so each dispensation advances that storyline in some way. Um, and so it, it really tells us about how the Bible fits together. How does the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together? Uh, each dispensation might introduce different characters. God, God, um, Christ is always the hero. You know, the devil is the villain. Uh, the conflict is, is that humanity has fallen into sin. The resolution, the conclusion is that um, God is going to make all things new in his kingdom. And so... Uh, dispensationalism helps us to understand how the parts of the Bible fit together and where we stand in that storyline of redemption. Um, I did you mentioned the difference between covenant theology and dispensational yeah. theology? Do you want me to say yeah. a couple words about that? Or yeah. I guess the biggest the biggest difference there is we dispensationalism sees a difference between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Church, right. whereas covenant theology tends to see. You know, Israel is the church. There's one continuous people of God 
different name, but the same sort of the same story. And some of the promises in the Old Testament that were made to Israel specifically are reinterpreted uh, to and applied to the church. So that's that's the biggest difference. It is uh, a sister theology. So we are we're trying to answer the same questions. We're just answering them in different ways. Brothers in Christ. This is an in in, in family discussion. Um, yeah. So, but I guess a um, lot, lot of very sincere, uh, God loving um, Christian brothers and sisters who believe in covenant theology, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't diminish that. Uh, you know their their belief, except for the I, I guess that we believe that you know God is uh, you know you know five six seven Schofield seven dispensations or different rather than the two covenants, um, kind of the Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, uh, it, it probably probably seen uh, most significantly in our esch eschatology and our, our study of end times because covenant theology uh, believes that the promises of uh, Israel are fulfilled primarily through the church. And uh, we believe that, uh, you know, Israel has been restored as a nation and will be restored again. Uh, in a millennial kingdom of which we will reign as priests and kings here uh, with Christ. Is that, would that be a summation of that? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really good. Eschatology would be a really big difference. Um, yeah, we, we both agree that Christ is coming back and that's right. great. Um, but yeah, what are the particulars leading up to, you know, this part of that? Yeah. And at least for good debate, hopefully we, we can do that uh, very civilly and uh, without hurting uh, other people's feelings and respecting uh, beliefs, uh, uh, understanding that, you know, I think that the thing for me, uh, uh, you know, for us and dispensationalism, that the, the, the key that holds everything together is, uh, is salvation uh, by faith through grace. Um, it, it, that would be a, a, a common theme through all dispensations, wouldn't it, Pastor? Yeah, and I, I think all evangelical Christians are going to agree that, that we're saved by grace through faith. And we see that, yeah, we see that throughout the Bible that that's, you know, that's, that's one of the common grounds, whether we're covenant or dispensational, we can agree that, you know, that that's like one of the foundation stones that we can agree on. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Chafer, uh, Ryrie, uh, Schofield, um, uh, our own uh, Charles Baker um, in the Grace Movement, uh, great theologians who have written extensively on uh on dispensationalism if you want to check that out a little bit more yeah um, there's there's a new book um sorry there, there's a new book i i don't have it pastor troy has it he, he was telling me about it it's on the history of dispensationalism and it's written by different authors one of one of our former professors from grace christian university write, writes a chapter um i don't know what the title is but talk to pastor troy and and uh okay he'll, he'll set you up yeah you know, and uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, and for those of you who like to listen to podcasts, if you if you come across uh, you know graduates uh, like Chuck Swindoll, uh, president, is he still president of Dallas Theological Seminary? No, no. Uh, okay, but he was at one point, and uh, Calvary Chapel. Uh, those types of movements are are dispensational in, in their beliefs. Anyway, let's move on. Um, so let's talk about uh, some practical application in these books. I think each one of these, I found them very helpful because um, I think if you, if you want to look at what a spirit-led life uh, would look like, each of these books uh, gives us very practical aspects of that. So, Pastor, we don't have time to talk about all of these, but maybe pick out one or two or three of, of the things that, that you saw uh, talking about practical living in these books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's Paul's part of Paul's outline is he he gives us this doctrinal teaching, but then he also gives us this practical section. Good. So the the doctrine is lived out. If it's just some this information download, then we're missing, you know, we're missing it. It's it's lived out in our lives. So yeah, Galatians 5, 19 to 23 talks about the fruit of the spirit. And so Paul talks about the deeds of the flesh, the old nature. But he talks about walking by the Spirit, and the Spirit is producing the spiritual fruit in us, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's like the opposite of the old sinful nature. 
Um, that's a great picture. That's in uh, Galatians. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God in uh, chapters uh, chapter 6, 10 to 20. We put on the armor of God. We're in a spiritual battle. We need to stand firm. So we have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness, feet covered with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and sword of the spirit. And how do we put those on? That's a great picture, but how do, what, how do we put those on? I think in prayer. We put them on in prayer each day, asking for God's protection, being aware of the spiritual dangers, being intentional about how we live. So we could, yeah, we could keep going. Is there any a, a passage that you wanted to? Uh, There's mention? a lot of them. Uh, you know, putting on the new man, uh, mm -hmm. taking off the old man, putting on the new man. Um, uh, you know, Colossians three one to seventeen. There's a whole diatribe of things that that uh, Paul goes through that would point to uh, living uh, being led by the Spirit. So I think that. I think, you know, sometimes in, in our, we, we question, are we being led by the spirit? Are we, are we, uh, you know, living the life that we should? And I think if you, I'll tell you, just go to one of these letters and uh, pick, pick out one of those passages and start reading that and say, are these attributes that I see? Or, or if you're really brave, have your spouse do that. Uh, <laughs> and see if you're living up to uh the you know the standards that god has not that we have to i mean everybody fails everybody stumbles uh, these are not these are standards they're not uh you know if i don't if i don't live up there i'm not i lose my salvation or anything like that but i i think it it gives us a very practical application and i appreciate that about uh, paul's letter because Personally, I like to spend the time on the theology and, and you know, I, I'm, I really like to understand things, but that practical living doesn't always, it doesn't always, you know, move over to the practical living for me. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. You put, you drew together these list of verses and it just made me think that, you know, Paul is a great theologian. Paul's also really good at using pictures and ideas like like the picture of the armor of God and, the, and you mentioned the putting off and the putting on like he's using these great pictures to help us think okay this is this is what it means to live it out or this is what we need to do so that was just something that came to my mind yeah well one such uh, area that he really talks about Colossians and Ephesians is this uh, family relationships pastor and that's kind of going to finish us up for today uh, but um you know, marriages, our family relationships, our, our kids, our grandkids, our, um, you know, our relationships among uh, our extended families. Uh, how do we, you know, what, what are some of your words of wisdom in building a legacy within the family that gives honor to God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in uh, Ephesians 5, Paul really has this really great section about husbands and wives, and then he goes on into children. And I think a word in a word, servanthood or devotion christ-like love um you know i think this is kind of countercultural. the christian idea of marriage and family is countercultural. in our culture today it's about me and my you know making me happy and you know and and Pat, paul shows us it's about putting the other person first he says husbands love your wives as christ loves the church that's pretty steep right i mean that's that's pretty intense there love your wife as Christ loved the church, yeah. he poured out his life for us. So husbands, yeah. pour, pour out your life for your wife and your family. Love your wife, like cherish your wife, um, serve her, you know, build her up. Um, you know, let her know how special she is. Um, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Well, that in, in our culture today, that would raise huge red flags. That's like, no, nah! but that's not demeaning. That's not saying you don't have a voice. That's saying you work together as partners and, and, you know, wives lift, lift up your husband and, and help him to become the leader that God wants him to be the godly spiritual leader in your home and, and help him partner together with him, uh, with children. Paul gives some great instructions. You know, he talks about children, obey your parents. We, we see a problem in our culture. That's, a, that's, a, that's always, that's a, that's a struggle throughout history, right? Um, yeah. there's that rebelliousness that's built into us because of sin. But Paul says, honor your parents. And then 
you know, he talks about parents and, and, and he says specifically to fathers, don't ex exasperate your children. You know, don't provoke your children. Don't be too hard on them. We want to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. But, you know, we can we can put too much pressure on them and be overbearing in some ways. And so um, just be mindful, be mindful of them. Don't be overly critical or harsh. Um, but but affirm them in the Lord and uh, build them up in the Lord. So uh, devotion, servanthood, Christ-like love. Those are the, yeah. I guess, the ingredients. That's good. I've listened to Pastor Jack Ibs last night. He talked about this uh, this passage here and said that, you know, you know, the husbands are actually that the concept here is, is like Jesus, the first in line to be sacrificed. So, um, you know, uh, so you you read through that you know that passage and you know the the uh the husband being the head of the household but it, it just means that he's the first in line to, to 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 be to be sacrificed and 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 you know just as as christ did and this whole term I, you know i think my opinion um is uh you know god gave us marriage for a lot of reasons, but probably most importantly is to, to show a good marriage relationship and the love that's shared between a husband and a wife is, is exemplary, is an example of the love that's shared be supposed to be between us and Christ. So, um, you know, that relationship, I, and that, that's how I try to think of, am I, you know, I love my wife and, and she's very, you know, she's very dear to me and tangible here, but do I, do I love God as much as I do her? And, and, and trying to think about that as an example of the relationship that I have with, with Jesus Christ. That's, a, yeah, I think that's a great point. Paul, I think makes that point that, that our marriages can really be a witness and really should be a witness to the world. God loves us. God loves us profoundly. Uh, Christ loves us profoundly. So, yeah. You know, yeah. The hardest thing I think that families are, the hardest thing that families are dealing with today, obviously, well, yeah, a lot of things, but time, time, time it, uh, in families, especially Christian families, uh, young uh, married uh, couples who are trying to raise uh, godly children. Um, there's so many good things that take the time of our kids and um you know good good is often the evil of what's best and uh i think you just have to be very careful about that and i and i'm not one to preach because i tell you our our kids spend a lot of time doing uh secular uh, events from sports and music and horses and 4-h and you know all kinds of things and and um yeah, if I were if I were raising kids today, um, I'd like to think I do I would do it differently, but I don't know. It's hard. It's it's a tough balance. You you want to give your kids an opportunity to to participate in different things, but you're right. We need to set priorities. I've been encouraged by by different friends that we have that set limits for their kids. You know, our kids need that. They need parents to set limits for them. Yeah. Say so you can you can do this many things and. We're going to guard these days because that's our day for, for worship and church. So it that's hard, Pastor. I applaud you for it. Continue. Uh, we'll pray for you. That's all I can say. We uh, need it. Yeah, we need it. <laughs> yeah, There's a lot of people doing it better than us. We're learning. We're learning as we well, go. Well, you're raising uh, kids and uh, ours are gone and, and uh, kind of moved on to grandkids. But uh, yeah, we it, it it's very difficult. Not easy. All right, so that kind of concludes our uh, our our overview of these books. And Pastor, we give, as always, we thank you for your time and uh, your knowledge and your commitment to to helping us uh, through the Bible. So, uh, would you close us in prayer today? Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these books of the Bible, and we thank you for the encouragement we find for our our practical lives, our daily living. May may our lives honor you. Uh, Lord, we pray for families. We pray for marriages. We pray that they would, uh, that we would, we would be drawn together and drawn together in the Lord, and that uh, the world would see our love for one another and our love for you, modeled in our relationships with one another. Uh, may we have this the sense of uh, of trust that Paul had as he was in prison, 
that he rejoiced in you and trusted in you. May we trust in you through all the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Just pray, um, Lord, that uh, your light would shine through us wherever we are today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. See you next time. <laughs>